Why do we worship? We worship because God is King. He is exalted over the nations. His glory is higher than the heavens. He is robed in majesty. And he is armed with strength. Who is like our God? He is glorious in holiness. He is awesome in splendor. And he performs great wonders. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the first and the last. He is the beginning and the end. But not only is God king, he is also kind. He is compassionate. He is gracious. He is slow to anger. And he is abounding in faithful love. And he has not dealt with us as our sins deserve or repaid us for our evil. He has purchased our freedom in Christ, and He has forgiven our sins. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have boldness in Christ, let us draw near, let us worship. Welcome to Treasure Lake Church. We truly want to draw near in worship. That's, that's actually the perfect way for us to approach our God. To stop and to say we adore, we recognize, and we reflect back to you the excellencies of, of who you are. We lift up a name that is precious and sweet. It is above all other names. And we recognize you as good and just, merciful and righteous. God, we worship you. In fact, our delight is in you more than anything. And Lord, teach us to delight in you. I'm really glad that we could spend time together today. And as we spend time together, we want to worship the name of Jesus, praise the Father, thank him for the gift of his spirit. And he does invite us to come before his throne with our many requests. There are many. Thank you very much that you uh, pray with us during this time. And I would ask that you would jot down some of these names and prayer concerns and that during the week that you would be praying as well. So let's take a moment and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we call you good and we call you holy. Holy, holy, holy is the name of the Lord and we are thankful that we will be exploring and understanding your holiness better and better. But what is true is that in what we understand right now, it does cause us to marvel. And so we stand amazed before the one who is other and great and powerful and good. Jesus, we thank you that you are a savior sufficient for us. Your power knows no limit. We thank you that we are in your hands and that you will take us home to be with you. We thank you that our destiny is clarified not by what we've done, but by what you have done. And Spirit, we thank you that you are walking with us each and every day. Lead us and guide us. We thank you for the strength that comes. We thank you for the gifts that have been given. We thank you, Father, that we are your kids. And as your kids, we have uh, many requests that we would like to say, Lord, would you please, would you please reach down and uh, heal Brad's lungs? Would you please bless Beth Smith? And would you please bless Denise this week? Father, we pray that uh, cancers would shrink. We pray that you would bless little Penn and Carter and Bernie and Dave. And for those who are suffering from painful consequences due to treatments, we pray that you would comfort them. We pray that those treatments would be incredibly successful and that the lease on life that these people want to experience, that they would truly experience it. Now, Father, we pray that you would take Julie through transitions and the letter arrive in a really good space place. We pray, Father, that Janet would get stronger and that Lana would feel better. We pray that Jimmy would have a very, really good week and one of strength in which he's able to say, boy, do I ever see good things coming my way. Now, Holy Father, we want to ask that you would bless Jason and that you would heal him from that fall from the ladder. We pray for Linda and Tracy who either are having or are recovering from hip surgeries and we pray that all of the physical therapy that follows would go extremely well. We pray for Kathy Donahue and her whole family that are 
missing very much, wonderful Mary. Heavenly Father, we uh, come to you when we need comfort, and we need it often. Lord God, we pray for this nation. We pray that we would be a group of people that relearns to honor your name and teach us, Father, to boldly stand up for your name, where uh, oftentimes your name is mostly heard as it is misused. Heavenly Father, you don't deserve that. We recognize it, and we are so sorry that that takes place. Heavenly Father, we ask that we would walk closely with you and that all we would do, we would do in the name of Jesus for the glory of God Almighty. Lord, we've gathered to worship, and we ask that our songs would be pleasant in your sight and in your ears. We pray, Father, that as we look to your word, that you would encourage us, enlighten us, and show us how to live. Build a great community here at Treasure Lake Church. Make us strong and ready to serve you at all times. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, the one who is worthy of all praise. Amen. Praise the Lord, His mercy is long, it's stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sin.
Hey Church family, they came with their Valentines. They came for a special evening. The food was great, the fellowship hall transformed, and the laughter contagious. It was just an amazing time, a time that said, I love you. We are thankful for love and for this community and for all of the creative people who made this happen. It could almost make you forget Punxsutawney Phil's bad news. Wednesday evening Bible studies are a blessing. God's word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Starting again this week, Get Fed is back. We'll gather for dinner in the fellowship hall at 530, but here's a new twist to our dinner together. We'd like for you to bring a side to share. We'll have the main course prepared and it will be accented with a variety of different flavors that everyone adds. Dinner's at 5.30, then at 6, we will all head to the study of our choice. Remember that childcare is provided. Winter Jam is almost here. Friday, February 24th, the bands will be playing and God will be lifted high. The youth will be hitting the road. If you would like to take part, please reach out to me by Tuesday, February 21st. As you entered the Welcome Center, you may have noticed the IF Gathering table. Ladies, we have a competent team ready to answer your questions and help you register for this special event. The weekend is March 3rd and 4th. Churches from our area will be joining us here for a wonderful time of inspiration. Due night is coming up fast. Hasta la vista, baby. The plans are progressing and here's the good news, we're doing it twice. That's right, our older dudes, 11 to 17 years old, are going to experience Dude Night on Friday, March 17th. They will experience challenges and events designed for young men. We'll be celebrating what it means to be a man. The following week, Friday, March 24th, our younger dudes are gathering, ages four to 10 years old, for a similar set of dude challenges and fun. Our dudes will need an adult to accompany them. This is going to be a great time for fathers and sons, or mothers and sons, or grandparents and grandkids to have an adventure together. So we're calling all dudes to join us for Dude Night. If this is your first time with us, thanks for being here. We welcome you. Please find the welcome card in the pew in front of you, fill it out and leave it in the basket by the sanctuary doors on your way out. There is great power in a testimony. A changed life, God comes, things are different, the story's told and we say, man, give me more of that. It's good for my soul to hear it. I'd, I'd like to play you some excerpts from someone's testimony. I think that your impression would be, wow, I would like to hear more than just these excerpts. But let's go ahead and enjoy this. If Christianity were true, and it meant you had to give up everything to follow God, would you want to know the truth? I finished the Quran when I was five years old, and by that time I had memorized the last seven chapters so that I could recite them during the five daily prayers. In my freshman year of college, my best friend and I had many conversations about faith. We argued all the time about Islam versus Christianity. It took a long time before I was able to determine for myself, even if I lose everything, it's worth it. And when my parents did find out, it was the most painful day of my life, probably the most painful day of their lives too. Now my whole life is Christ. There's just no, there's no, um, there's no connection anymore, but to have Christ in my life makes every loss worth it. Nabael was an unlikely person to put his faith in Jesus. I mean, he can remember so many years in which he would say that uh, sport for me was to try to meet with a Christian, have a little debate to embarrass them and show them how much better our faith is than yours and he would attempt to embarrass Christians. Unlikely that that person would bend his knee before Jesus and yet he does. You see, God goes after the unlikely, and His grace is sufficient for them. And those people who have changed lives, they usually don't say, hey, I just kind of want to hide and go silent, don't want anyone to know about the change. 
there's something rather different that happens. When people have experienced the grace and the goodness of God, they say, boy, I want to tell other people about it. It's just how it works. You see, those who are changed, they acquire a desire to proclaim the goodness of God and to let everyone know that God is special. And so Nabael has written books and he has lectured. He's interacted with people of the Muslim faith and of the Christian faith. And in our text today, we are reading again about someone who was unlikely who came to faith. His name was Saul, the persecutor of the church. God saved him while he was navigating a direction. He was heading up to a place called the, to, to Damascus. He was on that particular road. And God came and he said, I will save you. And not just would he save him, God Almighty would make him useful in the kingdom. And I think that thought just blessed Saul's life completely. You see, when God saves a person, he doesn't hold them in disdain and say, hey, because of everything you've done in the past, you're only going to be a second-class citizen in our kingdom. No, when, when God makes something new, he totally makes it new. The old is passed away, and with the new life comes new purpose and new opportunities and that is what Saul will begin to experience in the text that we see today. For this Saul who knew that the God who sent the divine light of Christ on the road could have sent a lightning bolt in order to protect the people of Damascus from Saul's plan. But instead, God has a plan and he sent to him a man by the name of Ananias. And the message that Ananias had was very interesting. For the Lord had said this to Ananias about this person, Saul. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I'll be honest. I would love to have been a fly on the wall when Saul was chatting with Ananias. I think there would have been multiple occasions in which Saul would have said, Now, now did I get that straight? you literally heard God say that I'm going to be his chosen instrument. Ananias, I, I think that you're sort of like a trustworthy character, but I'm just trying to swallow this. It's true that I am going to be serving him even after all that I've done. And Ananias would say, oh yes, you are going to be proclaiming the name of Jesus to the Gentiles. And that had to have been mind-bending for the Apostle Paul. For you see, it means that a great God has a great plan for someone who was a great sinner. And this meant that Saul's life would be completely changed. An instrument to the Gentiles. Well, Saul didn't like the Gentiles very much. Most Jews didn't. They might have been impertinent or they were despised because they weren't part of God's chosen people. Saul had no plans to be a blessing to the Gentiles, which means that God will change his heart, he will change his beliefs, and he will totally change his itinerary in order that the message will come to the world. And this message comes clear as a bell from Ananias. And so we pick up the story of Saul after he has had his chat with Ananias, and we see what it is that God is going to do through this person by the name of Saul in chapter 9, beginning in the middle of verse 19, Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. And at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard were astonished and they asked, Isn't this the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful, and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for a changed life, and we thank you that it tells us of how much our lives can be changed, so we give you glory and praise that you make all things new. Help us to hear and to understand just how great your goodness is. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Text begins with these words. At once, he, Saul, began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. You see, Saul knew what he knew. 
He knew that he had been confronted by a higher power, by someone who was greater. That light, divine light and the voice of Jesus speaking to him told him that there was something that he could not deny. Jesus was alive. He was the Messiah, as other people had said, and Saul had persecuted him. I think that as he met Jesus on the road, that it became so clear, so undeniable, that he turned his life 180 degrees and went in the other direction. I used to persecute Jesus, and now I'm proclaiming him. I used to say, don't think about him at all, and now I'm saying you should really worship him. His life is totally changed, and what a great moment for Saul. No doubt as a Jew, he would have spent a lot of his time saying, God, I'd be really happy if the Messiah came in this generation and he had just met the Messiah. Jesus had come speaking his name, Saul, Saul. And now he was finding that it was useful for him to serve God Almighty. What was true about Saul is everything that seemed to be so impossible for him on the road to Damascus, it became undeniably true. Jesus is the Son of God, and therefore Saul felt like he needed to set the record straight. I mean, he had made it plain left and right everywhere he went that Jesus was, a, was an imposter, and that it was a false faith. And, and so he can't let that stand because now he knows that he's wrong. And so he will take up the banner and say, it's time for me to clarify something. I'm changing my tune. I'm singing a different song. And the song is going to be sung loudly with full instrumentation. You've got to hear that I've changed my view on who Jesus is, and the shocking words that Saul uses are these. And he preached in the synagogues that this Jesus is actually the Son of God. Now, when it came to the Messiah, there were all sorts of predictions about him, but this was not particularly a Jewish prediction. In fact, Saul was going off script from everything that he had learned in his educational system. And I think that what happened was this, that Saul, as he met Jesus on the road to Damascus with the divine light shining on him, he understood in that moment that everything he had ever heard about the Messiah was far too small, way too small. Oh, yes, it is true that when the Messiah would come, he would restore the sight of the blind, and Jesus had done that. When the Messiah would come, he would come from the house of David, and Jesus was. When the Messiah would come, he would bring with him the new covenant, and that he had done. When the Messiah would come, he would introduce a new day, and that new day had come. But this Messiah, the one who had done all of those things, was bigger and greater and more powerful than all of that. Jesus was none other than the very Son of God. I think for you and I, it might be very difficult to grasp and to say, I really understand this thing of Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It takes me to the edge of what I know. But consider Saul, who had heard about God Almighty and worshipped Him, who was aware that there was a Spirit, but just wasn't expecting that there would be a Son of God. But when he met Him on the road, it became undeniable. In fact, the truth was is that it dawned on Saul that the words spoken by the angel to Mary were so true. The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And Saul got that. Jesus was God's son and he sang that song and he proclaimed it loudly and the qualifications for proclaiming the truth are but one. You simply need to know it and Saul said, man, do I know this to be true and therefore I'm preaching it in the synagogue. Jesus is the son of God and what we see in the life of Saul is this great truth. We see that when Jesus changes your life, you really want to tell other people about it. The good news must be told, there is a new song that must be sung, and Saul said, I will make the message known. And as he did so, all those who heard him were astonished, and they asked, isn't this the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Well, obviously, this was a shocking turn of events. 
the man who apparently hated the word of Jesus was now hallowing and honoring and worshiping the name of Jesus. I mean, it had to be as shocking for them as it was for the family of Nabael when he said from this point forward, instead of ridiculing Christians, I will be part of them. Instead of defaming the name of Jesus, I will worship him. I'm sure that his parents were taken back. Those who taught him the Quran were in disbelief. And there in Damascus, the people were shocked that a person by the name of Saul was changing everything that he previously had believed. It's so unusual. Usually what people do is they grab onto something and they hold to it unbudgingly, even if there is evidence to the contrary. So Saul must have seen something on the road to Damascus. For him it was undeniable, it was life-changing, and now Saul was ready to say, let me tell you all about it. So the text goes on. And yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. I, I think we could ask ourselves the question, so how in the world did that happen so fast? I mean, one day he, he's persecuting Christians and the next that he's proving it. How, how did he make the switch? Well, Paul was a scholar in the Old Testament and he knew all of the words very well. And once he laid aside his preconceived notion that Jesus couldn't be the Messiah and he began to think about the text that he had studied all of his life, he saw time and time again, well, this refers to Jesus, and that's what he did, and this is fulfilled in Jesus. And, and all of a sudden, he was looking at a mountain of proof, and he said, I just have to tell people that Jesus truly is the Son of God. You see, as far as Saul could see it, he had to say, this all makes sense to me. It makes sense that Jesus is the one who we were foretold. I can explain it, and when I explain it, I think that you should join me in it. And I love that attitude. It sure makes sense to me. You see, I think that our faith, it sure does make sense. Jesus did die on the cross, and he did rise again from the dead. There is evidence for that. Jesus is the one who can take away our sins, and the cross is the mechanism whereby that happens. I think that it makes sense. God Almighty is the creator of the universe. This makes all sorts of sense. And what Saul was not asking the people in Damascus to do was to join him in some sort of blind leap of faith. Not at all. Saul said, I'd like to tell you what I see and what I understand. I'd like to lay the proof out in front of you, and if you see the proof... I think you're going to join in on this. So let me digress just for a moment. You see, different cultures in different times, they have different understandings of words. And in our generation, a lot of people will talk about a blind leap of faith as if that might be a good definition of faith. Some might even say that the blinder the leap, the more radical the decision, the purer the faith is. I've heard that. You've heard that. Saul would have absolutely nothing to do with that. His leap was not blind. It was undeniable. He had met Jesus. He found proof within the scriptures. It was not a blind leap. It was a leap based on what he truly, truly understood. And you see, there is an accusation that becomes leveled at Christians based on that inaccurate definition of what faith is. You see, if faith is a blind leap, then many would say, well, then you believe because you do not understand, and it is your lack of understanding which inclines you to believe. And Saul would say, oh, no, not at all. I think about the words of my pastor, Ronnie, while I was in Budapest, and as he tells the story of his life, he often repeats this description. He said, when I came to Jesus... And when I thought about the faith that I had in him, my first impression in my early years was, man, did I ever have a great faith in Jesus. I mean, I really believed, and my faith was really big. And, and it had to be big because at that time, when I thought about the evidence that existed for Jesus and belief in him, I thought that the evidence was so small. And so it took a great faith in order to trust such small evidence Ronnie says, that's where I started in my faith. But what's true is that over the years, here's what I've understood, and I am thoroughly convinced of this. My faith is incredibly small. Smaller than it should be. 
And the evidence that exists for believing in God and trusting in Jesus is so great it fills oceans, it shouts from the sky that Jesus is the Messiah, he is risen from the dead, God is the maker of the heavens and earth and we desperately need him. Ronnie understands that our faith is small but the evidence is massive. As we think about Saul in this text, here's what we don't hear. We don't hear Saul running around telling everybody about his great faith. He's running around saying, let me show you the evidence so that you can believe as well. And I hope that all of this rings true to you. I hope it rings true that we have massive evidence to support the faith that we place in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if it doesn't ring true to you, then I would like to suggest that perhaps you would become familiar with a few names. If you are not familiar with the name of John Lennox, you would be blessed to become familiar with that name. If you have not heard of William Lane Craig, I would suggest that you would look up on YouTube and listen to the evidence that there is for our faith or a man by the name of Alistair McGrath. There is so so many reasons for us to believe. In fact, the truth is, is that there is overwhelming evidence that Jesus is who he said he, he is. Our text goes on and it says this, and after many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. And I, I know that we want to read about that conspiracy. It's highly intriguing, but we need to pause for a moment and question, how many days did go by? Many days, is that a month? Is that a year? Well, the interesting thing is, is that this person, Saul, whose name will be changed to Paul, he wrote much of the New Testament, and in other books, he chronicles things that took place during this time period, and there are words that he wrote in the book of Galatians, which we sort of need to fit in the timeline. I'd like for us to see what he said about his early years and how things took place, this being recorded in the book of Galatians. Verse, chapter 1, verse 15. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went into Arabia, and later I returned to Damascus. And then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him for 15 days. This text in Galatians refers to that Saul, very quickly after becoming a believer in Jesus, that he headed out into the Arabia Desert and he stayed there for three years. Well, those three years very much are connected to what we just read after many days had gone by. How many days? Well, that would be about 1,600 and uh, 1,065 days. And in between the end of verse 22 and 23, most scholars would say that is where Paul, Saul, ended up going out into the desert to spend extended time with God Almighty. To stand in front of him and say, these are all the things that I thought that I knew, and, and now I'd like for you to help me understand more clearly what they mean now that I understand who the Messiah is. And and so what we can do is we can put all of this together in a timeline, and that timeline looks something like this. Saul goes to Damascus to harass believers. And as he goes, Jesus meets him on the way, and he finds undeniable evidence that Jesus is the Son of God. He immediately, what we just discussed, was preaching and defending his faith in Damascus. And there, before a whole bunch of days passed, what he did was he went and he spent three years with Jesus in Arabia. And then he returns to Damascus, that's in verse 23, which we're picking up now. And when he returns to Damascus, there is persecution that arises and it targets Saul. Three years he spent with Jesus. Now, there's not a whole lot that's written about those three years, but most people would say this, it sure seems... Like Saul came out of the desert having some very well-studied and deeply formed convictions. He knew who Jesus was, he knew how to worship him, and he was ready to coach people on how to follow him. He had deeply studied convictions. It's a good thing that he did because as he came, the persecution would hit him straight in the face, and when the wind blows and howls, it is very good for us to have deeply held convictions. And so it would be my hope that... Uh, 
your involvement in TLC would not be described as, well, you know what we do together is we just sort of do the same old, the same old. And if that is the description, I'm sorry that I have not done a better job for. What we are attempting to do is spend time in God's Word so that our convictions will be developed, so that we will be strengthened, so that we will know the truth and when the winds blow and how that we will stand strong. For God has given us all the evidence that we need in order to follow Him well all the days of our lives. The text goes on this way. And after many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan, and day and night they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. Well, when you take a look at the plot that was hatched in order to trap Saul, it sure has a lot of sense to it. They wanted to catch him when he was leaving the city, walking out of the gates. And why would they do that? Well, it's a pretty good plan. If you're going to do something that's illegal, it's nice to do that without very many witnesses to see it. If you might be afraid that you'd get caught, it'd be nice to do it where there aren't very many authorities who could prosecute you. And so they are waiting for Saul to walk out of the city of Damascus, probably to head right back down the road that he met Jesus on, in which they're hoping to knock him off. But God Almighty, he lets Saul know that there's a plot, and uh, where there is crisis, there is innovation. And the innovation is that some of his friends, they let him down from the wall so he does not leave the city by its gates, and he escapes, and he goes to Jerusalem. And when he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles, and he told them how Saul, on his journey, had seen the Lord, and that the Lord had spoken to him, and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus." Well, I can certainly understand why people would be afraid of this person by the name of Saul, for he had a background and a reputation. And my thought is, may God bless Barnabas, who truly believed there is life change, and said, I will stand with you, for I have heard you speak in the name of Jesus, and I understand your heart, and I understand that our great God has great plans for people who were once great sinners. And so Saul, Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, and they tried to kill him. And when the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea, and they sent him off to Tarshish. Well, I think that this is an amazing moment to consider, for Saul has returned to the scene of the crime the scene where Jesus was crucified because he was declared a blasphemer. The scene where Stephen gave his life because he believed in Jesus and his clothes were laid at Saul's feet. He returned to the scene where he had gotten letters that permitted him to arrest people in the city of Damascus and incarcerate them and to bring them great grief. And he returned to the lion's den. And this time he is not a lion. This time as Saul returns, he is the prey of the lions, and the lions are angry and they attempt to kill him. What an interesting turn of events. The one who was persecuted, the one who was a persecutor now becomes the one who is persecuted. But this is not the end of the story for his friends wanting to protect him. We'll put him on a ship, he will go to Caesarea, he will leave for Tarshish, but later on, we will see him again, and he will be given a new name. His name will be Paul, and the gospel will go out from him to all of the Gentiles. And so here is what we see is great truth. You see, our great God has great plans for great sinners. And this sinner, Paul, knew what he knew, and therefore he said, I've got to tell you, for it is undeniable. Jesus is the Messiah. He actually is the Son of God. He loves you very much, and I want you to know that. And he spoke from deep deep convictions. The convictions that it's good for you and I to develop and hold on to, for the winds may blow and they may howl, but there are undeniable truths which we cling to. Jesus is the Son of God and worthy of our worship. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you could 
find a wonderful vessel and a servant in this man Saul that you would use him to bring light to the Gentiles and that he would be a witness to the truth. We thank you for what is undeniably true that we know that you are alive and you are in us and that you love us. We thank you, Father, that it is not a blind leap, but we have insurmountable evidence that there is a great God who loves us. Father God, we want to walk with you well. Thank you for how this story inspires us. We love you, Jesus. And we pray these things in the name of Christ, our Lord. Amen.